I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Ah, oh, well, you've reached the mansion of Leaves of Glen, where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. Eh, I'm running with this bit, and it'll never stop, I think. Uh, you can hear the crackling fire. You're currently in my drawing room, uh, where I greet you, which I found out recently a drawing room is just a living room. Uh, so that's not as exciting as you think it would be. This week, we're going to continue reading... Uh, David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. It's the eighth novel, uh, first published as a serial in 1849-1850, and then he turned it into a book at the end of that. Uh, It's widely considered his most popular work. Uh, Want to learn about when he was born and died? Sure, that's all anyone ever cares about anymore these days. Born the 7th of February, 1812, and he died the 9th of June, 1870. I don't have any... Fun facts, I'm running out. I was slowly reading this article about him trying to be a magician that turned out to be a a turd fest. It's not as exciting as I hoped it would be. Uh, So let's read the last part of uh, Charles Dickens, a.k.a. The Unparalleled Necromancer, from a Mental Floss article, where he has spent uh, most of the time that I've been reading about this uh, trying to be a magician because he decided that'd be cool. He bought out all the magic stuff from a a dying magic store and uh, called himself, racistly enough, Rhea Rama Roos. With, like, he'd wear a turban and everything, and he was just trying to be generally from India. Eh, you know, back in the times, he thought he was being cute. Maybe he even thought he was flattering, but nope, just racist. So, uh, last we left off, uh, he traveled around the country uh, doing his magic tricks as this racist persona, And uh, one of his friends was with him on this vacation and got seriously ill. And that's kind of where we left off. So uh, I guess he recovered. With the vacation over, Dickens was immediately back to work. David Copperfield was completed by November 1850, which, as you know, we are reading, and was quickly followed by the first installment of Bleak House less than 18 months later. Though the pressures of writing apparently left him little time to continue practicing his own conjuring act, Dickens nevertheless maintained an interest in magic. And while in France in 1854, he made a point of seeing a renowned French mind reader called Alfred de Caston. He was, Dickens later wrote, a perfectly original genius who puts any sort of knowledge of ledger, ledger domain Well, it's not on my Kindle, so I can't look up what the heck that's supposed to mean. Uh, Such as I suppose that I possessed at utter defiance. Dickens himself, however, never performed again. So, that's the end of that. What am I going to find about him? Because there's like ten more chapters here. So, I don't know what else I'm going to find to read about the author. Uh, Man, this podcast has turned into a lot of work. We're going to recap the previous chapter. Uh, So, his mom and the baby are dead. Sadly enough. And after the funeral, the Birdstones, nah, they fire Peggy. Uh, they let David go to Yarmouth with Peggy to hang with Emily, where he yeah, gets creepy on her, trying to kiss her, get his hand around her waist, that kind of thing. Mr. Barkus is also creepy towards Peggy, so there's kind of a dueling love thing going on there. And both are done inappropriately and highly awkwardly. Uh, but he never really speaks to Peggy, he just keeps showing up with random gifts, uh, hoping he's going to. You know, canvas an area and find something she likes. And then, um, and then just hangs around, not talking, uh, with her by the fireplace. And I guess she just giggles, giggles, uh, like a weirdo the whole time. And then they go on a picnic with, uh, Emily and David. And they stop at a church, get married real quick, and then, uh, go for the rest of the picnic, uh, now newly married and in love. 
After that, David has to go back to the Murdstone house, uh, his old house, uh, where they ignore him uh, just the whole time. And uh, then eventually, Murdstone arranges for David to get a job at a counting house in London. Well, there's the grandfather clock. Hey, I just recently found out my dad went into surgery and didn't tell anyone. So, Dad, if you're listening, I hope you're okay. Chapter 11. Ah, I begin life on my own account and don't like it. I know enough of the world now to have almost lost the capacity of being much surprised by eh, eh, anything. But it is a matter of some surprise to me even now that I can have been so easily thrown away. Burp at such an age. A child of excellent abilities and with strong powers of observation. Quick eager, eh, delicate, and soon hurt bodily or mentally. Now, it seems wonderful to me that nobody should have made any sign on my behalf, but none was made. And I, be, this is where he gets real, real down on the world around him. How come no one came out to support him? And I became, at ten years old, a little laboring hind in the service of Murdstone and Grinby. Murdstone and Grimby's warehouse was at the waterside. It was down in the Blackfriars. Modern improvements have been altered, uh, or have altered the place, but it was the last house at the bottom of a narrow street, curving downhill to the river with some stairs at the end where people took a boat. It was a, it's a crazy old house <laughs> with, a, with a wharf of its own, a budding on the water when the tide was in and on the mud when the tide was out and literally overrun with rats. Its paneled rooms, eh, discolored with the dirt and smoke of a hundred years, I dare say, its decaying floors and staircase, the squeaking and scuffling of the old gray rats down in the cellars, and the dirt and the rottenness of the place are things not many years ago in my mind, but of the present instant. They are all before me, just as they were in the evil hour when I went among them for the first time, with my, my, trembling, my trembling hand in Mr. Quinon's. Murdstone and Grimby's trade was among a, a good many kinds of people, but an important branch of it was the supply of wines and spirits to certain packet ships. I forget now uh, where they chiefly went, but I think there were some among them that made voyages, both the East and West Indies. Now, I know that a great many empty bottles were one of the consequences of this traffic, and that certain men and boys were employed to imagine them uh, against the light and reject those that were flawed, and to rinse and, and wash them when the empty bottles ran short. There were labels to be pasted on full ones, or corks to be fitted to them, or seals to be put upon the corks, or uh, finished bottles to be packed in uh, casks. All this work was my work, and of the boys employed upon it, I was one. Oh, so it's like a sweatshop, where they just cork alcohol and sell it to sailors. This sounds depressing as hell. There were three, eh, or four of us, counting me, my working place was established in the corner of the warehouse where Mr. Quinon could see me, uh, when he chose to stand up on the bottom rail of his stool in the courting house and uh, look at me through a window above the desk. Hither, on the first morning of my so auspiciously beginning life on my own account, the oldest of the regular boys was summoned to show me my business. His name was Mick Walter. Oops, screwed that up. Mick Walker. <laughs> and he wore a ragged apron and a paper cap. He informed me that his father was a bargeman and walked in the black velvet headdress in the Lord Mayor's show. Now, he also informed me that our uh, principal associate would be another boy who he introduced by the, by the dash to me dash extraordinary name of Mealy Potatoes. Oh, I discovered, however, <laughs> Mealy Potatoes... <laughs> I know that 
he's all about giving all of his characters bizarre names, but Mealy Potatoes is probably the most over-the-top one. I discovered, however, that this youth had not been christened by that name, but that it had been bestowed upon him in the, the warehouse on account of his complexion, which was pale or uh, mealy. Mealy's father was a waterman who had the additional distinction of being a fireman and was engaged as such at one of the large theaters. What's a waterman? All the rest of these kind of titles sort of make sense, but just being a waterman, that could mean anything. Being a fireman could be a waterman. I don't know, but I'm not going to look it up. It'd take too much work. We're just going to move on. Where some young relation of Mealy's, I think his little sister, did imps in the pantomimes. No words can express the secret agony of my soul as I sunk into this companionship compared these henceforth everyday associates with those of my happier childhood. Not to say with Steerforth, Traddles and the rest of these boys, uh, and felt my hopes of growing up to be learned and distinguished man crushed in my bosom. The deep remembrance of the sense I had of being utterly without hope now, of the shame I felt my position, of the misery it was to my young heart to believe that day by day what I had learned and thought and delighted in and raised my fancy and emulation up by would pass away from me little by little, never to be brought back any more. Cannot be written, period. Oh my God, that was a huge, huge paragraph. As often as Mick Walker burp went away in the course of that forenoon, I mingled my tears with the water in which I was washing the bottles and sobbed as if there were a, as if there were a, a flaw in my own breast and it were in danger of bursting. The counting house clock was at half past twelve and there was general preparation for going to dinner when Mr. Quinan uh, tapped at the courting house window and beckoned me to go in. Oh, I went in and found there was a stoutish, middle-aged person with a brown surtout and black tights. And what's a surtout? Because if there's black tights involved, I got to know what a surtout is. Surtout, a man's overcoat of a style similar to a frock coat. Late 17th century from the French, sir, over tout everything. All right, fine. Surtout uh, and black tights and shoes with no more hair upon his head, which was a large one and very shining in parentheses, than there was upon an egg. With a very extensive face, which he turned full upon me, his clothes were shabby, but he had an imposing shirt collar on. He carried a, a jaunty, ah, sort of stick with a large pair of rusty tassels to it and a, a, a quizzing glass. What's a quizzing glass? Well, I'm not going to look I'm not going to look everything up. Hung outside his coat for ornament. I afterwards found, as he very seldom looked through it, he looked through it. It was like a giant magnifying glass and couldn't see anything when he did. This, said Mr. Quinnon, in allusion to myself, is he. This, said the stranger with a certain condescending roll in his voice and a certain indescribable air of doing something genteel, which impressed me oh very much, is Master Copperfield. I hope I see you well, sir. I said I was very well and hoped he was. I was sufficiently ill at ease. Heaven knows, but it was not in my nature to complain much of the time of my life. So I said I was very well and hoped he was. I am, said the stranger, thank heaven quite well. I have received a letter from Mr. Murdstone in which he mentions that he would desire me to receive into an apartment in the rear of my house, which is at present unoccupied and is, in short, to be let as a... In short, said the stranger, with a smile and a burst of confidence, as a bedroom, the young beginner whom I have now the pleasure to, said the stranger, waved his hand and settled his chin upon a short collar, period. Oh, my God, that was a long one. This is Mr. McWibber. McWibber. M-I-C-A-W-B-E-R. McWibber. I don't know, whatever, said Mr. Quinnon to me. Ahem, said the stranger. That is my name. Mr. Rick McWeber, said Mr. Quinnon, 
QAnon, QAnon, wow, well, the times are bleeding through into my podcast. Suddenly QAnon is becoming part of this book. No, it's Quinon is uh, known to Mr. Murdstone. He takes orders for us on commission when he can't get any, and he has been written to by Mr. Murdstone on the subject of your lodgings. And he will receive you as a lodger. My address, said Mr. McWibber, is Windsor Terrace, City Road. I, in short, said Mr. Wickwibber, with a with the same genteel air, and in another burst of confidence, I live there. Eh, eh, made him a bow. Under the impression, said Mr. McWeber, that your, uh, peregrinations. Well, all right. Wow, this chapter's off to a horrible start. Peregrinate. Peregrinations. Travel or wander around from place to place. That your peregrinations in this metropolis have not yet been extensive, and that you might have some difficulty in penetrating <laughs> the Arcadia of the modern Babylon in the direction of the city road. In short, said Mr. McWeber, in another burst of confidence, that you might lose yourself, I shall be happy to call this evening and install you in the knowledge of the nearest way. Oh, I thanked him with all my heart for it was friendly in him to offer to take the trouble. At what hour, said Miss Mick, Mr. McWeber, shall I at about a eight, said Mr. Quinnon. At about eight, said Mr. McWeber, I beg to wish you good day, Mr. Quinnon, and I will intrude no longer. So eh, he put on his hat, he went out with his cane under his arm, yeah, very upright, humming a tune, when he is clear of the counting house, Mr. Quinnon then formally engaged me uh, to be as useful as I could in the warehouse of the Murdstone and Grimby at a salary, I think, of six shillings a week. Well, I'm not clear uh, whether it was six or uh, uh, seven. I'm inclined to believe from my uncertainty on this head that it was six at first and seven afterwards. Uh, eh, eh, he paid me a, a week down from his own pocket, I believe, in parentheses, and I gave Mealy sixpence out of it to get my trunk carried to Windsor Terrace that night. It being too heavy uh, for my strength, small as it was. Oh, that's sad. He's just a tiny little boy. It's a tiny little uh, trunk that he can't carry. I paid sixpence more eh, for my dinner, which was a meat pie, gross, and a turn at a neighboring pump. And past the... What, what is a neighboring pump? Just water? And past the hour which was allowed for that meal. And walking... Nah, walking about the streets. At the appointed time in the evening, Mr. Big Weber reappeared. I washed my hands and my face uh, to do the greater honor to his gentility. And we walked to our house, as I suppose I must have now called it together. Uh, Mr. Wicker impressing the name of the streets and the shapes of the corner houses around uh, upon me as we went along that I might find my way back easily in the morning. Arrived at the house in Windsor Terrace, parentheses, which I noticed was shabby, like himself, but also, like himself, made all the show it could. He presented me to a Mrs. Mick Weber, a thin, ugh, uh, and faded lady, uh, not a, not at all young, who was sitting in the parlor. The first floor was altogether unfurnished, but, and the blinds were kept down to delude the neighbors, uh, with a, 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 a baby at her breast. Uh, uh, this baby is one of the uh, twins. And I may remark here that I hardly ever, in all my experience of the family, saw both the twins detached from Miss McWeber at the same time. Ah, oh, gross. She's like, well, it's not gross. It's just weird that she's double teaming the feedings. One of them was always taking refreshment. There were, uh, nah, two other children. Uh, Master McWeber, aged about four, and uh, Miss McWeber, aged about three, these in a dark-complexioned young woman with a habit of snorting, who was a servant to the family and informed me before half an hour had expired that she was, quote, a orfling and came from St. Luke's warehouse in the neighborhood, completed with the establishment. Oh, my room was at the top of the house, at the back. 
a close chamber stenciled all over with ornament from which my young imagination represented as a blue muffin hmm, and a very scantily furnished. I never thought, said Miss McWeber, when she came up, twin and all, ugh, to show me the apartment and sat down to take breath before I was married when I lived with Papa and Mama that I should ever find it necessary to take a lodger. But Mr. McWeber, being in difficulties, all considerations of private feeling must give way. I said, yeah, Yes, ma'am. Mr. McWeber's difficulties are almost overwhelming just at present, said Mrs. McWeber. And whether it is possible to bring him through them, uh, I don't know. When I lived at home uh, with Papa and Mama... I really should have hardly understood what the word meant in the sense in which I now employ it, but experientia does it, as Papa used to say. Well, I said the word out loud. I don't know what it means, but I'm not going to look it up. I cannot satisfy myself whether she told me that Mr. McWeber had been an officer in the Marines or whether I uh, eh, imagined it. I only know that I believe to this hour that there was in the Marines once upon a time uh, without, without knowing why. He was a sort of town uh, traveler for a number of miscellaneous houses now and made little or nothing of it, I am afraid. Uh, uh, Mr. McWeber's creditors will not give him some time, said Mrs. McWeber. They must take the consequences, and the sooner they bring it to an issue, the better. Blood cannot be obtained from a stone. Neither can anything on account be obtained at present, not to mention the law expenses, from Mr. McWeber. I, I, would, I would count myself lucky if I was ever in a relationship with a woman who stood by me so fiercely as I am a complete financial loser. But Mr. McWeber found one, so good for him. I never quite uh, can quite understand whether my... Uh, precocious self-dependence uh, confused Mrs. McWeber in reference to my age or whether she was so full of the subject that she would have talked about it uh, to the very twins if there had been nobody else to communicate with. But this was the strain in which she began, and she went on accordingly all the time I knew her. Poor Mrs. McWeber. She said she had tried to exert herself, and so I have no doubt she had. The center of the street door was perfectly covered with a great brass plate on which was engraved Mrs. McWeber's boarding establishment for young ladies. But I never found out that any young lady had ever been to school there or that any young lady ever came or uh, uh, proposed to come or that the least preparation was ever made to receive any young lady. The only visitors I ever saw or heard of were uh, creditors. Oh, they used to come at all hours, and some of them were quite ferocious. One uh, dirty-faced man, I think he was a bootmaker, used to edge himself into the passage as early as 7 o'clock in the morning and call up the stairs to Miss Mick Mr. McWeber. Come! You ain't out yet. You know. Pay us, will you? Uh, don't hide. You know. That's mean. <laughs> I love the idea that a creditor... Uh, Normally, they call you on the phone at all hours or send a million messages. Uh, they never say, you're not paying me? That's mean. I wouldn't be as mean if I were you. Pay us, will you? You just, you just pay us, do you hear? Come. Receiving no answer to these taunts, he would mount in his wraith to the words swindlers and robbers. And these, being ineffectual too, would sometimes go to the extremity of crossing the street and roaring up at the windows of the second floor where he knew Mr. McWeber was. At these times, Mr. McWeber would be transported with grief and mortification, even to the length, as I was once made aware by a screaming from his wife, of making motions at himself with a razor. Oh, that's dramatic. But within half an hour afterwards, he would polish up his shoes eh, with extraordinary pains and go out humming a, humming a tune with a greater air of gentility than ever. Ah, Mrs. McWeber was 
quite as elastic. I've known her to be thrown into fainting fits by the king's taxes at three o'clock, and then to eat uh, lamb chops, breaded, and drink warm ale, uh, for two teaspoons had gone to the pawnbrokers, at four. On occasion, when an, ex- when an execution had just been put in, coming home through some chance as early as six o'clock, I saw her lying, of course, with a, with a twin, under the ga- a grate in a swoon with her hair all torn about her face. But I never knew her more cheerful than she was. That the very same night, over a veal cutlet before the kitchen fire, telling me stories about her papa and mama, and the company they used to keep. In this house, and with this family, I passed my leisure time, my own exclusive breakfast of a penny loaf and a penny worth of milk I provided eh, myself. I kept another small loaf and a modicum of cheese on a particular shelf of a particular cupboard to make my supper on when I came back at night. This made a hole in the six or seven shillings, I know well, and I was out at the warehouse all day. I had to support myself on that money all week. From Monday morning till Saturday night, I had no advice, no counsel, no encouragement, no consolation, no assistance, no support of any kind from anyone that I can call to mind as as I hope to go to heaven exclamation point I was so young and childish and so little qualified and how could I be otherwise dash to undertake the whole charge of my own existence that often in going to Murdstones and Grimby's of a morning I could not resist this stale pastry put out for the sale at a half price at a pastry cook's doors and spent in them this is no periods and spent in that money I should have kept for my dinner period Uh, then I went without my dinner or bought a roll or a slice of pudding and I remember two pudding shops between which I was divided. Oh, according to my finances. One was in a court close to St. Martin's Church at the back of the church, which is now removed altogether. The pudding, oh, oh, the pudding at that shop was made of currants. It was rather a, a special pudding, but was dear. Two pennyworth, not to being larger than a pennyworth of more than ordinary pudding. Uh, a good shop for the latter was in the Strand, somewhere in that part of which was a rebuilt sense. And it was a, a stout pale pudding, heavy, ugh, and flabby. A flabby pudding? God, that sounds disgusting. What has it got, like, layers? And with the great flat raisins in it, stuck in a hole at wide distances apart, and it came up uh, hot about my time every day, and many a day I did I dine off with it. When I dined uh, regularly and handsomely, I had a savoy and a penny loaf or a four-penny plate. This is weirdly tedious because I have no idea what he's talking about. I'm not from England, and I have no idea what any of this stuff is except for pudding, which maybe they have a different definition for pudding than I understand it. I think of Bill Cosby talking about uh, jello pudding. But if it's a flabby one, I don't know what the heck that's supposed to mean. Uh, Red beef from a cook shop or a plate of bread and cheese and a glass of beer. The kids ate from a miserable old public house opposite our place, a business called Lion or the Lion and something else that I have forgotten. Once I remember carrying my own bread, which I had brought from home in the morning, under my arm wrapped in a piece of paper, Eh, like like a book. And going to a famous a la mode beef house near Drury Lane and ordering a small plate, in, in quotes, of that delicacy to eat with it. What the waiter thought of such a strange little apparition coming in all alone, I don't know, but I, I can see him now staring at me as I ate my dinner and bringing up the other waiter to look. I gave him a half penny for himself, and I wish he hadn't taken it. Yeah, my daughters did something similar. There's a pizza place nearby my my home that they rode their bikes to a couple summers ago before before COVID hit. And uh, they took a bunch of cash and they just went and uh, got there and ordered a pizza for themselves and ate it. And the waiter didn't know what to do with them. They weren't infants. They were uh, tweens. But yeah, just expected a parent there the whole time. So look at him writing about something we all experience even in the modern day. We had a half an hour, I think, for tea. 
When I had money enough, I used to get a half pint of ready-made coffee and a slice of bread and butter. When I had none, I used to look at a venison shop in Fleet Street, where I have uh, strolled at such time as far as the Covenant Garden Market and stared at the pineapples. Oh, I was fond of wandering about the Adelphi. Because it was a mysterious place with those dark arches. I see myself emerging one evening from one of these arches on a a little public house close to the river with an open space before it where some coal heavers were dancing. That's weird. To look at whom I sat down upon a bench. I, I wonder what they thought of me. Well, what do you think of them? They're dancing. I was such a child and so little that frequently when I went into the bar of a strange public house for... Oh, jeez, burp. A glass of ale or porter to moisten what I had had for dinner. They were afraid to give it to me. I remember one hot evening, I went to the bar of a public house and said to the landlord, ah, what's, your, what's your best, your, your very best ale, uh, a glass? For it was a special occasion. I don't know what, it may have been my birthday. Two pence, half penny, said the landlord. It is the price of the... Genuine stunning ale. Then, says I, producing the money, just draw me a glass of the genuine stunning, if you please, with a good head to it. Who asks for a good head? Man, beer culture has changed over the last hundred so years. Because now you get a head on you, you're like, ah, crap, there's a big head of beer. Now you got to sit there and, uh, what, what's the trick? You take earwax on your pinky and you stir it around in there. It's uh, witchcraft. None of it means anything, but he wants a good head. Also, he's eight. How many child alcoholics were there back in this time? The landlord looked at me in return uh, over the bar from head to foot with a strange smile on his face and insisted of drawing the beer, looked around the screen and said something to his wife. She, she came out from behind it and with her work in her hand and joined him in surveying me. Here we stand, all three before me now, the landlord in his shirt sleeves, leaning against the bar window frame, his his wife looking over the little half door, and I, in some confusion, looking up at them from outside the partition. They asked me a good many questions, as what my name was, how old I was, where I lived, uh, how I was employed, and how I, how I came there. To all of which, that I might commit nobody, I invented, I'm afraid, appropriate answers, and they served me with the ale, though I suspect it was not the genuine stunning, and the landlord's wife, opening the little half door of the bar, and bending down, gave me my money back. Oh, that's nice of her. I mean, he's still drinking alcohol, but that's nice of her. And gave me a, oh, it gave me, it gave me a kiss that was half admiring and, and half compassionate, but all, but all womanly and good, I'm sure. Well, with that, why don't we take a little break? Let's get out of the library. Let's go into the master bedroom. And let me tell you about a new upcoming romance novel. I see you put on that dress I like. There. On my master bed with the blood-red silk sheets. Now, that's very considerate of you, but that's not what I want. Instead, I want you to put on this, this, this cloak and, uh, this weird laser attachment, uh, to your glasses. For some reason, I'm imagining you wearing glasses. As I read to you a review of Kingdom of the Shadow and Light, uh, by Karen Marie Moaning. Michaela Lane faces the ultimate threat when war breaks out between the kingdoms of shadow and light as the number one New York Times best-selling fever series races to an explosive revelation. You know, I read something recently on uh, Reddit, of all places, that someone says, how come every book is a New York Times best-selling author or best-selling series? And somebody else wrote, uh, it takes almost nothing to be considered a New York Times best-selling whatever uh, for a week. And then that way, uh, it helps out all the publishing houses that want that to be able to broadcast and have bookstores put on the front shelves. And since all of these books are Penguin Random House books, oh, they're all in on the grift. 
From the moment Michaela Lane arrived in Dublin to hunt her sister's murderer, she's had to fight one dangerous battle after the next to survive, to secure power, and to keep her, eh, her city safe to protect the people she loves. That's nice of her. As a matter of who's good and who's evil can be decided by the answer to a single question. Whose side are you on? Now, as High Queen of the Fae, Mac faces her greatest challenge yet, ruling the very race she was born to hunt and kill. A race that wants her dead yesterday. So they can put a pure blood fake queen on the throne. Burp. But challenges with her subjects are the least of her concerns when an ancient, deadly foe resurfaces, changing not only the rules of the game, but the very game itself initiating a catastrophic sequence of events which have devastating consequences and leave Mac questioning everything she's ever learned and everyone she's ever loved, period. Now begins an epic battle between mortal and fey, seely and unseely, would-be kings and uh, would-be queens with possession of the unseely king's virtually unlimited power and the fate of humanity at stake. From the exquisite, deadly gardens of the High Queen's Court to long-forgotten truths found in the sacred grove of creation. From the, ooh, finally, something about romance and all this BS. From the erotic bed of her enigmatic, powerful lover to the darkest, seductive reaches of the unseely kingdom, Mac's final journey takes her places no human has ever been before. And only one human could possibly survive. Dot, 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 one who's willing to sacrifice, and this part is in italics, everything. Well, I hope that worked you into a lather. I know I feel absolutely nothing. So with that, let's dive into the rest of this chapter. Well, continuing on, we just learned that a, a a couple, a husband and wife, that own this bar think it's adorable that this little kid is just sitting there drinking their beer. I know I do not exaggerate unconsciously or unintentionally. The scantiness of my resources or the difficulties of my life. I know that if a shilling were given to me by Mr. Quinnon any time, I, I spent it in a dinner or a tea. Well, he's a humble man. I know that I worked from morning until night with common men and, and boys and a, a shabby child. I know that I lounged about the streets insufficiently and unsatisfactorily fed. I know that, but uh, for the mercy of God, I might easily have been for any care that was taken of me, a little robber or a little vagabond. Yet I held some station at Murdstone and Grinby's too. Besides that, Mr. Q- Quinon, Quinon, well, maybe you should just embrace it and call him Quinon. Mr. Quinon, he's really into bizarre conspiracy theories, did what a careless man so occupied and dealing with a thing so anomalous could to treat me as one upon a different footing from the rest. I never said to man or boy how it was that I came to be there or gave the least indication of being sorry that I was there, that I suffered in secret, and that I suffered exquisitely, and no one ever knew but I. Oh, how much I suffered. It is, as I have said already, utterly beyond my power to tell. But I kept my own counsel, and I did my own work, and I knew from the first that if I could not do my work as well as any of the rest, I could not hold myself above slight and contempt. I soon became at least as expeditious and as skillful as either of the other boys, though perfectly familiar with them. My conduct and manner were different enough from theirs to place a space between us. Oh, good, he's still putting on airs, still got a comeuppance. They and the men generally spoke of me as eh, the little gent, or the, the young suffocator. A certain man named Gregory, uh, who was foreman of the Packers, and another named Tip, 
who was the carman, and wore a red jacket, used to address me sometimes as David, but I think it was mostly when we were very confidential, and when I had made some efforts to entertain them uh, over our work with some results of the old readings, which were fast perishing out of my remembrance. Oh, so he's telling about the books he read a long time ago? Mealy potatoes <laughs> rose once and rebelled against my being so distinguished, but Mick Walker uh, settled him in no time. Oh, so he's already got an older boy taking care of him, just like in the school. There's kind of a vibe there I don't know if I'm comfortable with. My rescue from this kind of existence I considered quite hopeless and abandoned as such altogether. I am solemnly convinced that I never for one hour was reconciled to it or was otherwise than miserably unhappy. Oh, but I bore it. And even a Peggotty, partly for the love of her and partly for shame, never in any letter, though many passed between us, revealed the truth. Mr. Mickweber's difficulties were in addition to the distressed state of my mind. In my forlorn state, I became quite attached to the family and used to walk about busy with Mrs. Mickweber's calculations of ways and means and heavy with the weight of Mr. Mickweber's debts. And, uh, on a Saturday night which was my grand treat, partially because it was a great thing to walk home with six or seven shillings in my pocket, looking into the shops and thinking that such a, a sum would buy. And partly because I went home early, Mrs. Mickweber would make the most heart-rending conferences, confidences to me. Also, on a Sunday morning, when I mixed the portion of tea or coffee I had bought overnight in a, in a little shaving pot, gross, and sat late for shaving, and sat late at my breakfast. It was nothing at all unusual for Mr. McWeber to sob violently at the beginning of one of these Saturday night conversations and sing about Jack's delight being his lovely nan toward the end of it. I have known him come home to supper with a flood of tears. God, everyone around him is just got a lot of their own stuff going on and no one cares about little David and a declaration that nothing was now left but a jail and to go to bed making a calculation of the expense of putting bow windows to the house in case anything turned up, which was his favorite expression, and Mrs. McWeber was just the same. A curious equality of friendship, originating, I suppose, in our respective circumstances, sprung up between me and these people, notwithstanding the ludicrous disparity in our years, period. Ugh. But I never allowed myself to be propelled upon uh, prevailed upon to accept any invitation to eat and drink with them out of their stock, parentheses, knowing that they got on badly with the butcher and the baker and had often not too much for themselves, until Mrs. McWeber took me into her entire confidence. This she did one evening as follows. Master Copperfield, said Mrs. McWeber, I make no stranger of you, and therefore do not hesitate to say that Mr. McWeber's difficulties are coming to a crisis. It made me very miserable to hear it. And I looked at Mrs. McWeber's red eyes with the uh, utmost sympathy, with the exception of the heel of a Dutch cheese, which is not adapted to the wants of a young family, said Mrs. McWeber. There is really not a scrap of anything in the larder. I was accustomed to... What's a larder? Tell me it's a like a, a cabinet, because I have one, and I want to be able to... Yeah, it's a cupboard for storing food. Oh, I'm going to start using that with my kids. Go to the larder and get your chips. Oh, you want something to eat? Go to the larder and get your can of soup. Well, now I got so worked in a ladder, I lost my place. Uh, I was accustomed to speak of the larder when I lived with Papa and Mama, and I used the word almost unconsciously. What I mean to express is that there is nothing to eat in the house. Oh, dear me, I said in great concern. And I had two or three shillings of my week's money in my pocket, from which I presumed that it must have been on a Wednesday night when we held this conversation. And I uh, hastily produced them, and with heartfelt emotion, begged Miss McWeber to accept them as a, as a loan. Oh, I've met people like this in my life. <laughs> I lived in a neighborhood with a lot of poor people when I was growing up, and one of them was a person that used to just milk her friends 
And she had a church. She'd go to church. She'd milk them for money and just go on and on about how hard her life is. And the church actually bought her a, a whole car, which she accepted tearily and then never went back to church again. I think she sold the car. <laughs> so there's just people that take advantage of everyone, including kids around them. So it's good to see that happening here in this book. Uh, and I produced them with heartfelt emotion and begged Miss Mecker to accept them as a loan. But the lady kissing me, gross, and making me put them back in my pocket, okay, replied that she couldn't think of it. Well, then stop complaining to the kid about your grown-up problems. No, my dear Master Copperfield, said she, far be it from my thoughts. Oh, but you have a, a discretion beyond your years. Well, it's called being poor and can render me another kind of service, if you will, and a service I will thankfully accept of. Oh, oh, I begged Miss McWeber to name it. I have parted with the plate myself, said Mrs. McWeber. Six tea, two salt, and a pair of sugars, <laughs> which I have at different times borrowed money on in secret with my own hands. But the twins, the twins are a great tie. And to me, with my recollections of uh, Papa... And mama, these transactions are very painful. There are still a few trifles that we could part with. Mr. Wickover's feelings would never allow him to dispose of them. And uh, click it. Uh, this was the girl from the workhouse. Being of a vulgar mind would take painful liberties if so much confidence was reposed to her. Master Copperfield, if I might ask you. I understood Miss, Mac Miss Mick Weber now and begged her to make use of me to any extent. I began to dispose of the more portable articles of property that very evening and went out on a similar expedition almost every morning before I went to Murdstone and Grimby's. Mr. Wick Weber had a few books on the little chiffoner, which he called the library, and those went first. I carried them one after another to a bookstall in the city road, on part of which, near our house, was almost all bookstalls and bird shops, and then sold them for whatever they would bring. The keeper of the bookstall, who lived in a little house behind it, used to get tipsy every night. Oh, had to be very violently scolded by his wife every morning. More than once, when I went there early, I had audience of him in a turn-up bedstead with a cut in his forehead or a, or, or a black eye, bearing witness to his excesses overnight, and I am afraid in parentheses, he was quarrelsome in his drink. And he, with a shaking hand, endeavored to find the needful shillings in one or another of the pockets of his clothes, which lay upon the floor, while his wife, with a baby in her arms and shoes down at her heel, never left off rating him, period. My God, that was long, and it was all commas. Sometimes he had lost his money, and then he would ask me to, to call again. Oh, but his wife had already got some and taken his, I dare say, while he was drunk, and secretly completed the bargain on the stairs as we went down together. At the pawnbroker's shop, too, uh, I began to be very well known. The principal gentleman who officiated behind the counter took a, took a good deal of notice of me, and off his got me, I recollect, to decline a Latin noun <laughs> or adjective and <laughs> to conjugate a Latin verb in his ear. Oh, that's kind of creepy. While he transacted my business. Uh, who says a child? Uh, as I'm pulling up your money, whisper, whisper Latin in my ear as I hand you cash. That sounds pretty gross. After all these occasions, Mrs. McWeber had made a little treat which was generally a supper, and there was a peculiar, particular relish in these meals, which I well remember. At last, Mr. McWeber's difficulties came to a crisis. Oh, finally. And he was arrested early one morning. Oh, and carried over to the King's Bench Prison in the borough. He told me, as he went out of the house, that the, that the god of the day had now gone down upon him, and I really thought his heart was broken, and mine too. But I heard afterwards that he was seen to play a lively game at Skittles before noon. <laughs> well, I'm not going to look it up, but uh, what the heck is Skittles for a grown man to play? On the first Sunday after he was taken there, I was to go and see him and have, a, have dinner with him. I was to ask my way to such place, just short of that place, I could see such another place, and just short of that, I could see a yard, which shows the cross. And I kept straight on until I saw a turnkey, 
Uh, all this I did, and when at last I did see a turnkey, parentheses, poor little fellow that I was, and thought how, when Roderick Random was in a debtor's prison, there was a man there with nothing on him but an old rug. The turnkey swam before my dimmed eyes and my beating heart. Mr. McWeber, nah, he's waiting for me within the gate, and we went up to his room, top story but one. This is a prison where you can have dinner with the person and go up to their room, and cried very much. He solemnly conjured me, I remember, to take warning by his fate, and to observe that if a man had 20 pounds a year for his income and spent 19 pounds, 19 shillings, and six pence, he would be happy. But that if he spent 20 pounds, one would be miserable. After which he, eh, he borrowed a shilling off me for a porter, uh, gave me a written order on Miss Wicker uh, for the amount, and put away his pocket handkerchief, and, uh, and cheered up. Now we sat before a little fire. What kind of prison is this? Uh, with two bricks put within the rusty gate, uh, one on each side, to prevent its burning too many coals, until another debtor who had shared the room with Mr. Wicker uh, uh, came in from the bakehouse. With his loin of mutton, what kind of prison is this? <laughs> Which was our joint stock repast. When I was sent up to Captain Hopkins in the room overhead with Mr. McWeber's compliments, and I was his young friend, and would Captain Hopkins lend me a knife and fork? Captain Hopkins lent me his knife and fork with compliments to Mr. McWeber. There was a very dirty lady in his little room. What? and two wan girls, huh? oh, his daughters, with shock heads of hair. I thought it was better to borrow Captain Hopkins' knife and fork than Captain Hopkins' comb. Ha <laughs> get it? He's got gross hair. The captain himself was in the last extremity of shabbiness, with large whiskers and an old brown greatcoat with no other coat below it. Oh, I saw his bed rolled up in a corner and what plates and dishes and pots he had on a shelf and I divined, God knows how, uh, that though the girls with the shock heads of hair were Captain Hopkins' children, the dirty lady was not married to Captain Hopkins. Ooh, gross old man with two gross kids has got a, got some side action. My timid station on his threshold was not occupied more than a couple of minutes at most, but I came down again with all this in my knowledge as surely as the knife and the fork were in my hand. Yeah, it was something gypsy-like and agreeable in the dinner. After all, I took back Captain Hopkins' knife and fork early in the afternoon and went home to comfort Miss McWeber with an account of my visit. She fainted when she saw me return and made a little jug of egg hot afterwards. What's egg hot? Uh, to console us while we talked it over. Ooh, egg hot sounds delicious. Just like a cup of hot egg <laughs> that you sort of eat, drink. That'd be fantastic. I don't know how the household furniture came to be sold for the family benefit, or who sold it, except that I did not. Sold it was, however, and carried away in a, in a van, except the bed, uh, a few chairs, and the kitchen table. With these possessions, we encamped, as it were, in the two parlors of the emptied house in Windsor Terrace. Mrs. McWeber, uh, the children, the Orfling, and myself and lived in these rooms night and day. Now, I have no, no idea how long, though it seems to me for a long time at last, Miss McWeber resolved to move into the prison. Well, Mr. McWeber had now secured a room to himself. How? I'll stop. But it's still shocking to me. What kind of prison is this? Is it just a place that poor people go? Not really a prison, because you've done something wrong and you're being detained? You can have your wife move in. You got a room. You can go borrow a knife and fork from the, the warden or whatever. This is all weird. So I took the key of the house to the landlord, who was very glad to get it, and the beds were sent over to the king's bench except mine, for which a little room was hired outside the walls of the neighborhood of that institution, very much to my satisfaction, since the Migwebers and I had become too used to one another in our troubles to part. Oh, well, he's found another peggity. The Orfling was likewise accommodated with an inexpensive lodging in the same neighborhood. Mine was a quiet back garret with a sloping roof commanding a pleasant prospect of the timber yard. And when I took possession of it, 
with the reflection that Mr. McWeber's troubles had come to a crisis at last, I thought it quite a, uh, quite a paradise. Hmm. And at this time, I was working at Murdstone and Grimby's in the same common way, and with the same common companions and the same sense of unmerited degradation as of the first. But I never, happily for me, no doubt, made a single acquaintance or spoke to any of the many boys whom I saw daily going in and out of the warehouse and providing, prowling about the streets at the mealtimes. I led the same secretly unhappy life, but I led it in the same lonely, self-reliant manner. The only changes I'm conscious of are, firstly, that I had grown more eh, shabby, and secondly, that I was now relieved of much of the weight of Mr. and Mrs. Mickwiver's cares, for some relatives or friends had engaged to help them at their present pass, and they lived more comfortably in the prison than they had lived for a long while out of it. Oh, I used to breakfast with them now, in virtue of some arrangement, of which I have forgotten the details. I forget, too, at uh, what hour the gates were opened in the morning, admitting of my going in, but I know that I was often up at uh, eh, six o'clock, and then my favorite lounging place in the interval was the old London Bridge, where I was wont to sit in one of the stone recesses, watching the people go by, or uh, to look over the balderstrads at the sun shining in the water, and lighting up the golden flame at the top of the monument. The, uh, uh, the Orfling met me here sometimes, to be told some astonishing fictions respecting the wharves and the tower, of which I could say no more that, that I hope that I believe them myself. In the evening, I used to go back to the prison, walk up and down the parade of Mr. McWeber, or play casino with Mrs. McWeber. What kind of prison is this? I'll stop. I'll let it go. I'm just being repetitive at this point. And to hear reminiscence of her papa and her mama, whether Mr. Murdstone knew where I was, I'm unable to say. I never told them at Murdstone and Grimby's. Mr. McWeber's affairs, although past their crisis, were very much involved by reason of a certain, quote, deed, of which I used to hear a great deal, and of which I suppose now to have been some former composition with his creditors, though I was so far from being clear about it then that I am conscious of having confounded it with those demonical parchments which are, are held to have, once upon a time, obtained a great extent in Germany, period. Oh my God, that was a long one. At last, this document appeared to be got out of the way somehow, at all events, it ceased to be the rock ahead it had been. And Mrs. McWibber informed me that her, quote, her family had decided that Mr. Wickerer should apply for his release under the Insolvent Debitors Act. Debtors Act. Why did I say debitors? That was weird. Uh, which would set him free, she expected, in about six weeks. What kind of jail or prison is this? <laughs> I gotta let it go. I gotta let it go. And then said Mr. McWibber, who was present, I have no doubt I shall, please heaven, begin to be beforehand with the world and to live in a perfectly new manner, if, in short, if anything turns up. By the way of going in for anything that might be on the cards, I, I call to mind that Mr. McWibber, about this time, composed a petition to the House of Commons, praying for an alteration in the law of imprisonment for debt. I set down this remembrance here because it is an instance to myself of the manner in which I fitted my old books to my altered life, with burp which made stories for myself, out of the streets <clears throat> and out of men and women. And how some main points in the character I shall unconsciously develop, I suppose, in writing my life were gradually forming all this while. Oh, there was a, a club in the prison. Again. Okay, I'm letting it go. In which Mr. McWeber is a gentleman, which was a great authority. Mr. McWeber had stated his idea of this petition to the club, and the club had strongly approved of the same. Wherefore, Mr. McWeber, who was thoroughly good-natured man, as active a creature as anything about his own affairs ever existed, and never so happy as when he was busy about something uh, that could never be of profit to him, set to work at the petition, invented it, engrossed it on an immense sheet of paper, spread it out on a table, and appointed a time for all the club, and all within the walls if they chose to come up to his room and sign it. 
When I heard of this approaching ceremony, I was so anxious to see them all come in, one after another, though I knew the greater part of them already, and they, me, that I got an hour's leave of absence from Mr. Murdstone and Grimby's and established myself in a corner for that purpose, as many of the principal members of the club as could be got into the small room without fitting it uh, supported Mr. McWeber in front of the petition, while my old friend Captain Hopkins, who had washed himself <laughs> to do honor to, to so solemn an occasion, stationed himself close to it and read it all to who were unacquainted with its contents. The door was then thrown open, and the general population began to come in, in a long file, several waiting outside while one entered, affixed his signature and went out. To everybody in succession, Captain Hopkins said, eh, have, have you read it? No. Would you like to hear it read? If he weakly showed the least disposition to hear it, Captain Hopkins, in a loud sonorous voice, gave him every word of it. The captain would have read it twenty thousand times if twenty thousand people would have heard him, one by one. I remember a certain luscious roll he gave it to such phrases as the people's representatives in parliament assembled. <laughs> your petitioners therefore humbly approach your honorable house, his gracious majesty's unfortunate subjects, as if the words were something real in his mouth and, and, and delicious, delicious to taste. Mr. McWeber, meanwhile, listening with a little of an author's vanity and contemplating, not severely, the spikes of the opposite wall, as I walked to and fro daily between Southwark and Blackfriars and lounged about at mealtimes in obscure streets, the stones of which may, for anything I know, be worn at this moment by my childish feet. Oh, I wonder how many of these people were wanting in the crowd that used to come filing before me and review again to, to the echo of Captain Hopkins' voice! Exclamation point. When my thoughts go back now to that slow agony of my youth, I wonder how much of the histories I invented for such people hangs in a mist of fancy over well-remembered facts. When I tread the old ground, I do not wonder that I seem to see in pity. Going on before me, an innocent, romantic boy, making his imaginative world out of such strange experiences and sordid things. Well, there we go. And with that, let's retire to the smoking room to review what we've read. Well, uh, what happened in this chapter? David goes to work for uh, Murdstone and Grimby. Uh, apparently, th they just make uh, wine and spirits and ship them to sailors and creepy people. David's job is to refill old bottles and pack them for shipment. David goes to live in a spare room at the McQuimby family. <clears throat> and uh, they have financial problems which he gets to hear all about. So he winds up having to donate most of his income to them, besides them getting money for him living there. Uh, soon he's pawning things for them, and uh, they uh, so they can buy food and stuff. But Quibi is uh, eventually arrested and put in debtor's prison, which apparently doesn't sound like a real prison because you get your own room and you can have friends over and have dinner and wander around. It's not like a real prison at all, which is so disappointing for me because you're not really suffering, especially if you can bring your family there to live with you. It's not a, a prison for people with debt issues. It's just a free housing, I guess, at that point, which isn't the worst if you're low income and have uh, debt issues. But then it's not a prison. Just stop calling it a prison. So his family joins him there. Uh, they start to slowly scheme their way out of debt, uh, relying on the charity of uh, other family members and stuff. Uh, and so David doesn't get to live with them. They don't drag him along to live in the beautiful environment of the debtor's prison. Uh, he has to find someplace else to live, and he's super lonely. <clears throat> What's good about this chapter? Well, again, like always, well-written. 
Uh, I kind of wish that it was, there was more periods in a paragraph. That'd be helpful to me as a reader. But sucks to me. I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, what sucks? That uh, David has to live such a hard life. I know at some point in this book, he's going to have a better life and things are going to start looking up for him. But uh, we as readers have to slog through how surprisingly worse and worse things can get for this small small alcoholic boy. What do we learn? Uh, adults continue to take advantage of you. And uh, if you're not smart enough to dance around that, do the, uh, the verbal and social acrobatics to get out of uh, giving all your money away to a person that will actually ask a young child uh, for help, um, it's going to happen. Luckily, Mrs. Uh, Mick Weber, or whatever her name is, said, uh, no, I don't want your money, but I want you to do a lot of extra work for me by selling all of our stuff. So, one way or another, yeah, adults keep screwing you over. So, watch out for adults. Uh, even if you're as old as me, look out for people that are in their 70s, because they will always take advantage of you. Well, with that, uh, again, I'd like to say... Uh, uh, good luck to my dad. I found out that he had hernia surgery as I was recording this podcast because he'd been kind of quiet for a while. Don't get to see him much because of COVID. And uh, so I always try to keep in touch with texting or if he's got a computer problem, we'll FaceTime and that kind of thing. But didn't hear from him for a while. So I reached out to him and found out he had an actual surgery on a hernia. So uh, I think hernias are mostly in your stomach. But potentially they could also be in your butt. So I'm hoping it's not the uh, the uh, the latter. So good luck to you, uh, kind sir. <laughs> and for the rest of you, I will uh, talk to you next week. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. You can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, uh, along with episodes from the Book Boys and uh, blah, blah, blah. You can also find me on Instagram, uh, which is a uh, House Nuzzle. And conveniently enough, uh, Twitter, which is also at House Nuzzle. Annoyingly, YouTube made me pick a name instead of just a house nuzzle. So I got Glenn Nuzzles. So I guess you search for that if you want to watch a screen that doesn't do anything and just hear my voice. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's one left.